uh, I don't knock books out quickly, uh, partly because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. In fact, I'm a lot of a perfectionist. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is James Heyman. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I am your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over on the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find Author Stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right ha- right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover designed for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to aippconline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with book one, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE Smackdown with the legions of a boss level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a death. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have James Heyman on the show with me today. Uh, He has a fantastic new book called A Fatal Obsession uh, that is absolutely riveting. And uh, those of you that love a great mystery thriller like I do are absolutely going to love this book. Uh, Welcome to the show, James. Well, thank you for having me, Hank. I enjoy, I'm sure I'll enjoy being here. Uh, well, I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Uh, I think a storyteller rather than a writer. When I was a little kid, I made up stories all the time. Uh, and when I say a little kid, I mean seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, I would create plays and little dramas with my baseball cards being the uh, characters in my stories. <laughs> and I would draw maps of uh, the land or the territory where the story was taking place. And uh, uh, they were usually military. I mean, I did war stories uh, at, 
that time. But uh, it was always a story, uh, uh, somebody who imagined and made up stories uh, pretty much all my life. I love that. I, I uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, that people are born storytellers and then whether you decide to go on and, and become a writer and an author and, and publish those stories is an entirely different thing. But you either have that gift or you don't, I think. Yeah, that was what I was best at. Uh, I couldn't keep my mind from wandering off into strange places and uh, <laughs> dreaming up strange characters, doing various things. Um, and sometimes it cost me in school because I wasn't paying attention to the uh, algebra or the geometry. I was uh, much more interested in uh, what people were thinking or people might be doing. So uh, I think that's a pretty clear to me. Yeah, I think that's a very common thread with with people that have been on the show is that school is uh kind of secondary to to the real stuff that was going on. <laughs> yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. yeah. Um you said that you like to tell war stories. Um what what other types of things did you uh evolve into for your love of stories that you like to read and then go on to tell? The other kind of stories I like to read um uh, were dog stories. Uh, uh, there was a writer uh, many years ago named Albert Payson Terhune who wrote stories about dogs who would go off and have adventures, and he was one of my favorites. And uh, I also love to read uh, baseball stories. Uh, I still remember the title of my favorite uh, uh, book when I was like seven or eight years old, uh, The Kid from Left Field, about uh, a kid, you know, who was a real kid, but somehow breaks into the major leagues uh, through some sort of magical ability. Love that. Um, you uh, you talk about on on your your website and your bio that you and your uh, your main protagonist of your books, Detective Sergeant Mike McCabe, uh, are have uh, have a lot of similarities. You, you both are native New Yorkers. Um, you went to. Uh, uh, McCabe went to NYU film school and, uh, and, and you, uh, went, where did you go to school? I have lost it. I'm, uh, I went to college at Brown university right, in Brown, Providence. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you both, uh, at, what happened? Well, first off, what, what happened after you went to school? Um, you went to Brown and, but really didn't have an idea of what you wanted to do in life. Did you? No, I didn't. I, I didn't have a clue. I mean, most of the uh, my classmates and fraternity brothers were doing things like going to law school or going to business school or getting jobs at banks, and so I sort of considered doing that kind of thing. But uh, the idea of it really turned me off. It just wasn't who I was. And I have to credit my brother, who was twelve years older uh, than me, uh, for saying, "Well, you ought to follow what your your." talents are and i think you're make a much better creative person than you would uh, a banker or a lawyer uh and i think he was absolutely right but i have to credit him for pushing me in that direction so uh, and 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 for uh for acknowledging the the gift of creativity and not just saying you know you, you just have your head in the clouds all the time yeah, no, he was very encouraging. He, uh, I think he knew me as well as anyone, and uh, uh, he had gone to law school and was working on Wall Street, and he just knew that wasn't me, uh, even though he was sort of uh, kind of like a second father to me, and my first instinct was to do what he had done, but he, he knew that wasn't right, and we talked about it, and uh, I decided to try to find a job doing something creative. And and so your brother winds up on Wall Street, and and you make your way over to Madison Avenue. Uh, right. It, at the time, uh, that was I, I think you say that that was kind of the the only logical outlet for the creativity was to get into the advertising business. Well, I needed to find somebody who would pay me a regular <laughs> salary for dreaming up crazy ideas and. Uh, uh, the only the only business I could think of that would do that were advertising agencies, and uh, indeed, uh, they paid me a very little bit to begin with. But uh, as I grew in the business, uh, I made a good living, uh, dreaming up you know sometimes nutty but sometimes uh, uh, fun ideas and shooting commercials, uh, literally all over the world. And those days, 
we didn't have computers to do it for us, so we would have to go to Europe to shoot if there was a you know a, a European scene in the commercial, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I had had a great time. I must admit. Well, as a creative person and as a, a natural born storyteller, uh, you know, other than novelists, that there's not much else that that would kind of scratch that itch, is there? Uh, not a heck of a lot. It never occurred to me that I could make a living as a novelist. It's, I sort of had an idea that I'd like to at some point, but, uh, you know, I didn't want to live off my parents. They frankly couldn't afford to keep me any longer. <laughs> they put me through college right. and, uh, uh, I needed to find somebody who would pay me to do this kind of thing on a regular basis. And, uh, uh, I worked for what, uh, was at the time the largest ad agency in the world, a pl- uh, company called Young and Rubicam, for well over 20 years, and uh, uh, dreamed up all sorts of things. Uh, one of my biggest clients was the U.S. Army, and we would go over to Europe and uh, uh, shoot commercials of the Army, doing what they do, riding tanks and guarding the uh, age of the uh, uh, Cold War guarding that, you know, Iron Curtain and uh, shot commercials of uh, a whole battalion of the 82nd Airborne Division jumping out of airplanes just for being my cameraman. I remember told a story. Yeah, I remember those commercials. Those were amazing. (laughs) Uh, It was, you know, it was the campaign was Be All You Could Be was the theme line of the campaign. And I was the creative director on it. And it was a lot of fun. Which is a lot better than an army of one. Uh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did not approve. <laughs> yeah, I was long, long gone from the army when that started, but yeah. I, re- I found that a very peculiar kind of, uh, appeal to make. Yeah. I, you know. I don't think that's appealed to anyone, to be honest, but, no. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. We could, we could argue that all day. Um, so, um, so you were very successful. You're doing something that you absolutely loved, and you were getting to be creative, and people were giving you paychecks to be creative. Uh, there, but I'm assuming there was something inside you that that kept hearkening back to wanting to tell other stories, long form stories, writing novels. Uh, what was that awakening for you, or or was there? Um, that drew you back to wanting to do that? There was an awakening. It was, it was, you know, that itch you always want to scratch, but there's always the mortgage to pay and the kids to put through college. And so I kept working at what I was doing uh, until uh, oh, about 30 years or so had passed. And uh, I left the agency business and uh, did some freelance marketing writing for a while. But then I said uh, to myself as, You know, as I was getting older, listen, if I'm ever going to write that novel I've been, you know, teasing myself with, uh, I'd better get busy doing it. So uh, uh, to my wife's credit, she said, fine. Uh, So we won't make money for a while. She's a painter, you know, which is not, you know, unless you happen to be uh, a famous painter, doesn't pay a great deal. And uh, I set to work. Uh, wrote the, literally the first fiction, uh, fictionalized story that I had ever written other than commercials, which a lot of people would say was fiction of their own sort. But uh, And uh, it took me 18 months to write it. I dreamed up this character, Michael McCabe, uh, who, as you mentioned earlier, uh, was kind of based on me in terms of being a New Yorker who moved to Maine, which... I did with my wife and also uh, being somebody who loves old movies and loves the stories of old movies and had sort of flirted with being a movie director, but then he had to make a living. And so he joined what he called the family business, which was the New York police department. And um, eventually he left the NYPD and moved up to Portland and uh, became a detective sergeant of the Portland police department. Uh, continues to follow you around, uh, apparently. <laughs> he continues to follow. I follow him around. You follow right? him around. Or, yeah. I lead him by the nose sometimes. But <laughs> I love that. I love uh, that. But he often tells me where he wants to go. It's you know the old um, uh, story of uh, 
do you uh, plan your stories out in advance or do you sort of write them as the characters tell you what should happen next, which uh, writers often call writing by the seat of their pants or pantsers. And I'm definitely in that category. Uh, uh, I could, I know McCabe well enough and I know his partner Maggie well enough to know what they think, would think about certain things and what they would want to do next and how they would go about doing it. So I let them lead me to the next, uh, you know, the bit, next bit of drama in the story, the next uh, action in the story, and the next dialogue in the story. James, I had another conversation with a, another writer earlier this morning for a, a, another show that I recorded, and we had the, such a similar conversation. She said that in when she was writing her, her book that she would get discouraged, and she knew that she had made a commitment to her husband to finish this project, so she wanted to, to do that for him. But she had also made a commitment to the characters she was writing to finish their story, and just as if they were – flesh and bone characters she had to honor that commitment to them and and talked about the the relationship with these fictional characters that she had and and i and i you know i was nodding my head yes because uh and i said if you were to tell that story to any other group of people besides the listeners of this podcast they they would you know maybe be concerned about you but uh we all here <laughs> we all here have that same experience we we you know listen to the voices and we do what they tell us to and they pay us to do it so that's <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty well, great. there's no guarantee that they're going to pay oh, no, you to no, do no. it when you set off to write your first novel. That's right. Um, I was very lucky. I finished it, and I found a, a very good agent very quickly, and uh, uh, she sold it to uh, a major publisher, Macmillan, uh, uh, St. Martin's uh, Minotaur, uh, for a two-book contract, and uh, I was probably more surprised than anyone that uh, – Literally, the first fiction that I had written as fiction uh, uh, actually sold to a well-respected uh, publishing company. Absolutely, that is that is uh, uh, that is not common. Let's just say that's a, no. I, when I'm at the writers' conferences and people ask me how I get got started, I say <laughs> something like that. There are an awful lot of dirty looks. <laughs> <laughs> So I spent an afternoon, and uh, yeah, then we got published. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, earlier that that uh, if you were going to write the book that you had, you know, been thinking about, I forget exactly how you phrased it, but the, it, you, it sounded to me as if there was a story that you knew already um, that you needed to tell. It, it, is that true, or was it just the the idea of the story that kept haunting you? Did, did you well, have the characters I, already? I guess is what I'm asking. Or did I have what? I'm sorry. Did, did you have the characters already? And was there a shape of story or just the desire to? Well, I when I set off to write uh, uh, a thriller, a suspense thriller, I examined the books that I enjoyed most reading and the characters that I most enjoyed reading about. And one of my favorites at the time was uh, Michael Connolly, who has, as I'm sure you know, uh, character Harry Bosch, Hieronymus Bosch. And I loved the Bosch stories, and I loved Dennis LeHaye's stories of his two private eyes, uh, uh, Patrick uh, Kinsey and uh, Angie Gennaro. And so I sort of determined that I wanted to write a story in that mold but obviously, I wanted characters who were mine and not theirs. Uh, and so, you know, I started thinking, uh, who should my hero be? And uh, as I, I think I alluded to, uh, one of the oldest uh, cliches about writing there is, uh, is write what you know. And I know me better than I know anyone. So I sort of based uh, McCabe's personality and character on my own personality and character. He tells dumb jokes. I tell dumb jokes. He likes good scotch. I like good scotch. Uh, he's a big fan of the New York football giants, even though they were just terrible last year. And I'm still a big fan. <laughs> so funny. Um, you, your, uh, your character in Mike McCabe, uh, was a, was a film student and then joined the, uh, the family business as, as you put it, uh, or as he puts yep. it. Um, what do you think that does for him as, as a detective, as a character, having that artistic background? And, uh, do you think that, uh, 
uh, that helps him uh, to frame situations and, and solve uh, mysteries because he has that that different outlook on life with his creative background? I think so. I think in the second book, I'm very explicit about it, where he's examining a murder site and he's pacing it off and setting it up, setting camera positions, how he would look at things, how he would approach the uh, the property where the murder took place. And uh, he, you know, references uh, uh, the kind of shot he would do. And uh, I think actually with my own film background through commercials, I tend to write uh, cinematically. I will set a scene very explicitly. And as that scene is set up, I will move in on the characters and then start going back and forth between the characters through dialogue, which is basically how you make a movie. And uh, uh, people have told me that my books are very cinematic, that they can see them playing out as film. So yeah, absolutely. That uh, that's that's been my experience. Uh, absolutely. Um, when uh, when you set out to write a, a police procedural, I I know that you were a fan of, of the the Bosch series and and others, and that uh, helps to inform the writing. I'm sure after kind of immersing yourself in those genres and uh, you pick up things. Uh, but was it as someone who comes from a, a creative background, uh, was it a a tough thing to write a police procedural and get into that, that gritty kind of mindset. And not only that, but just getting the details, right. Uh, it was a big part of the original challenge. And, uh, as I was sort of dreaming up my plot and my story, I knew I had to learn about how detectives work and, uh, how, what procedures they follow. And so I called the Portland police department and the woman answered and I said, uh, I'm a writer. I'm writing a detective story uh, that is about the Portland police, but I don't really know that much about them. Is there anyone you could recommend who might be willing to work with me to learn about it? And she said, oh, yes. Uh, we had uh, uh, a detective sergeant who recently retired, and he would be perfect. He's uh, now teaching criminal justice at the local community college. And uh, so I called this guy up. His name is Tom Joyce. And asked if he'd be willing to talk to me, and he said absolutely, and we set a date. And our initial date was uh, uh, took us pretty much through an entire day. And uh, uh, we sat in Tom's office, and uh, I asked questions, told him about the sort of story I was thinking about, and asked him how the Portland police would uh, assign personnel to handle it, how they would approach the investigation, how they would approach the forensics. Uh, what kind of resources they would bring to bear on it. And he was terribly helpful. I mean, uh, he couldn't have been more helpful. And uh, I have worked with Tom ever since on all six of the uh, McCabe novels that I've uh, written. Uh, whenever I have a question, uh, I will email him. He always emails me back within a you know, uh, couple of hours and talk about it. Or uh, not infrequently, we'll go out and uh, have lunch together and we'll talk about it. He, in fact, has just written a blog, uh, which I have posted on my website, uh, about our relationship and uh, how he was delighted to work with me on it because he thought it was important that uh, writers, novelists, who are writing police procedurals get the details right. And uh, so he's been very generous with his time. Well, and, and my experience with, uh, uh, with, with, with calling on law enforcement myself to, to ask questions, but also other writers I've talked to, um, have a, a very similar experience. Most, uh, most local, uh, police or, or even the FBI, I've talked to a couple of writers who have great relationships with, with some FBI offices. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're more than happy to answer questions because, uh, they, they get, you know they're they're um you know the the subject of a lot of news uh you know articles and stories get it and, right yeah yeah they, yeah they 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 would much rather have the story right and right. uh and and yeah that that's been my experience is they're they're more than happy uh to try to you know at least help you get the facts right and i think uh to a to a person the uh, the police i've talked to 
have said, you know, the TV shows, the Law and Order shows, and uh, the other shows, uh, the CSU, uh, uh, are so often inaccurate that it irritates <laughs> them, and they like yeah. to make it correct. And uh, uh, I think it should be correct. And I think a, a novelist owes it to his readers to get it as correct as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the new book, uh, A Fatal Obsession, is this your fifth or sixth, uh, McCabe? This is, this is number six. Number six. Okay. And in this book, um, you you really up the ante for uh, McCabe in that uh, he has a beloved family member who is in trouble. Uh, where did where did this story come from? And, and tell us a little bit about Zoe McCabe. Uh, well, Zoe McCabe is a 24-year-old actress, aspiring actress, and who's just beginning to uh, get gain some success on the New York stage off Broadway. And she is the daughter of McCabe's older brother, Bobby, who is an attorney in New York. And the idea of, of using a family member uh, really grew out of me asking myself, how can I up the ante? Uh, McCabe is the kind of cop who always wants to, you know, make things right for the victim by catching the bad guy. But when it's family, that makes the, uh, the stakes that much more critical and much more important. And there's no way he was going to, uh, with the kidnapping of his niece, who he loves dearly and uh, obviously has known all her life. Uh, and, uh, that, you know, I, I think the best way to put it is it just upped the ante for him. It made it even more important than it normally was to catch the bad guy. And uh, in some regards, coming back to New York and working with the NYPD uh, was kind of sticking his nose in something that technically wasn't his business. But he had enough connections in the New York Police Department from his earlier career there that he was able to, to make it stick. And... Uh, uh, it was fun for me, right? You know, I had written five books, uh, basically about the Portland Police Department. It was fun for me to, in a sense, go home to New York in the sixth novel. Uh, and it's obviously a city I know very well, having been born and raised there. And, uh, uh, I enjoyed, you know, writing in a different setting. Yeah. Um, you, you've talked about how close you are personally um, uh, to Mike McCabe and Zoe's father is, is an older brother who is an attorney uh, in New York, which uh, parallels your older brother uh, in New York. That's true. Uh, did, that is true. Did, uh, did he call you and say, uh, Hey James, leave my family alone. <laughs> <laughs> Who became his brother? <laughs> <laughs> right. Sadly, my brother passed away a number of years ago. He uh, had, uh, died from cancer when he was still uh, a fairly young man. Oh, but, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, he would have felt pretty. I know he would have felt pretty strongly about a family connection making the whole thing more important. Absolutely. And uh, and and there there really is no better way than to ra ratchet up the tension than to put those personal stakes in it because up to this point, um, you know, uh, McCabe can, can kind of walk away knowing he did the right thing and, and he's personally involved in these people's stories. But at the end of the day, he gets to go home. Uh, but with his niece involved, that, that's a whole, yeah, there's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. If he didn't go and try to find the bad guy and if she died as a result of his not being involved, he would never forgive himself. I mean, that would be, uh, uh, you know, something he'd have to live with for, th for the rest of his life and something he really wouldn't be able to live with. Uh, and uh, his partner, Maggie, uh, refuses to let him do it without her because she's been his partner through all the books and uh, she is going to work this case with him. Uh, and... Maggie is another character I'm very fond of. Uh, I sort of have a crush on an ima imaginary woman, uh, <laughs> which my wife doesn't mind since she's a figment of my imagination. I'm glad you brought up uh, Maggie Savage because uh, she she really is an integral part of these stories that you tell. They, she is the uh, 
kind of the the counterbalance uh, to to Mike. Um, where did she originally come from? And and when you're writing them, uh, is that a conscious thing to to have her kind of balance McCabe out or to uh, allow her to bring in uh, different aspects that that uh, McCabe could not do? Well, initially, uh, I had planned the first book as McCabe being the hero and thought I would write the series with just McCabe being the hero, like Bosch is the hero in Michael Connelly's books. But uh, I introduced Maggie, her, you know, uh, co-star Billy, as it were. But uh, as I wrote her, I liked her more and more, and she grew on me as a character and as a counterbalance to the way McCabe thinks. And uh, it didn't take me very long to realize that it made a lot of sense to have uh, a co-star, a female co-star, uh, who would work with him and over a, the course of the series develop a very close personal relationship with him. Um, after having written six books in the series and, and now uh, the characters of, of, of McCabe and, and Savage are, are very well set and uh, – for readers, uh, for sure, we can drop right into the story and pick up what's going on. And I would imagine, uh, for the writer, for you, uh, it, it probably is, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot less world building that you need to do, I guess is probably a good way of saying it because we've got history with these characters. Um, when you start a book now, uh, I know you said that that first book took you about a year and a half to write, I think. Uh, what is a production schedule like on, on a new book? <coughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't knock books out quickly, uh, partly because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. In fact, I'm a lot of a perfectionist. Uh, took me a year and a half to write because I wrote it, I rewrote it, and I rewrote what I rewrote until it was as good as I thought I could possibly make it. Which is and probably why it sold the way it did. I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think, uh, probably why people enjoy the uh, books so much. They, when I'm done with the so-called first draft, it is in no way a first draft. It's a pretty polished, finished draft. Uh, 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 when I did that first book, The Cutting, uh, and it was sold to uh, uh, St. Martin's Press, I had a very good editor there, but he basically had no edits. He said, uh, I like it. And he said, no, we're going to go with it. So, And uh, uh, most of my editors have been uh, pretty uh, pretty much the same. I have a wonderful, uh, I'm now with Harper Collins, uh, William Morrow, and I have a wonderful editor there. And, uh, but she, you know, will make some suggestions, but uh, the writing is usually pretty, pretty polished and pretty finished when I finish what, you know, some would call a first draft. It's not really a first draft at all. Uh, I've rewritten each chapter probably a dozen times. So as you're writing, uh, because uh, you, uh, you know, self-admittedly are, are a pantser, uh, if, if you want to use that term. Um, right. And uh, your, your books are f full of so many twists and turns and, and you know, uh, mysteries that have to be unraveled. And uh, so, uh, therefore, there's a lot of foreshadowing and, and things that go into that. Um, as you're writing... And, and you're figuring the story out. Are you going back and editing those previous chapters to, you know, maybe I, I need to put a hint in here. I need to allude to something here. I do that all the time. I mean, if I finish a chapter and then uh, refinish the chapter and then go on and do something else, and it kind of changes in a sense what might have come before. So I will go back, you know, to wherever it was before and, uh, make the adjustments that are necessary to make the story hold together and to flow better. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, so that first draft is kind of a living draft as, as it kind of uh, oh, very much so. yeah, grows. Um, that's fantastic. Well, the, the new book is, uh, is amazing. It's called a fatal Obs obsession. When, uh, when this episode goes out, it's available everywhere. Uh, James, I'm a huge fan. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Well, thank you very, very much, Hank, for having me. I uh, enjoy talking about writing, obviously, and uh, I'm glad you've enjoyed the book. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. 
Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. Natalie? It's Artie. Listen, I'm going to be late for dinner. I ran out of gas on... He climbed out of the car and peered at the sign. On Sleepy Hollow Road? There's nothing but trees and I have to find a gas station. Save me a drumstick. He hung up his cell and stuck it in his pocket, zipping his jacket. He was going to have to walk and pray somebody picked him up. A sliver of crescent moon hung above, surrounded by clouds, like a grinning drunk asleep in a puddle. Artie walked, using his tablet as a flashlight, eyes on the gravel ahead. He crossed over a dark ravine. The trunks and overhanging branches were matted thick with wild grapevines and threw a cavernous gloom over the road. A figure stood at a crossroads ahead. It looked pale and wan and blue. A woman? He had an impression of fragility and age and thought of his warty old landlady. But his landlady would not be standing at a crossroads in the dark. Excuse me? Artie said, surprised by the fear in his own voice. Do you know where I can find a gas station? I'm... I'm empty. Then let me feel you, the figure whispered. It rushed at him. It entered him. He dropped the tablet, fell to his knees, and lost his body to another driver. When Artie woke again, he was dangling in midair. The woods were pitch black. The only lights were fireflies. Fireflies everywhere, like dancing stars. He struggled and cried out, his yellow sneakers trying to find the ground. Shh, said a voice. It will all be over soon. Panic rose. He felt invisible hands on his legs, on his arms, invisible fingers around his neck, reaching up the back of his shirt. He heard the sound of water running below, high and agitated, as if through a stony brook. The crescent moon swung out of the sky, falling into the water. Blood rushed into his cheeks. He realized he had been flipped upside down. He yelled and groped, flecking his own face with spit, helpless to drive away whatever was attacking him. He felt a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and air flew out of his lungs. A spray of blood hit his cheeks, hot and clinging. His hands found a sharp branch protruding from his body. It had speared him through his back and out through his chest. He tried to say help, but had no air to form the word. Blood poured up his body. No, it poured down. It only felt as if it were rising, climbing his neck, covering his face, gathering in his scalp. He reached for the ribbon of blood that fell from his crown into the trickle of moonlight below. The ribbon slipped through his fingers. It thinned, choked, became a tiny rivulet. His tanks were empty, not even fumes. His engine began to sputter. The flow became a drip, a maddening drip like the drip, drip, drip of his kitchen faucet, the drip his landlady hadn't fixed, the drip that kept him up at night. This drip would not be keeping him up. He would sleep very well this night, very well indeed. The fireflies slipped into shadow. A figure appeared, blue as gaslight, bony and toothless, a crone from a fairy tale. Thank you, my friends, she whispered. I am thankful for this good harvest. She neared, scrutinized him with manic intensity, and turned away, muttering to herself in a sing-song rhythm as she, too, vanished into the trees. A man may toil from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. 